So what I was going to talk about was um, nothing, I'm not going to come up with any theory or concept or anything, I was just going to talk through, because when the idea was mooted I thought, well how can I do this, I'm not really an expert on this, so I was going to talk through some of the things that I encountered <coughs> on my way and hopefully try and draw some lessons out of that. So it's not a big lecture or anything, it's more sort of just some ideas that came to me around this topic and then we can explore through them. And one of the first ones when we were looking at this idea of evidence and advocacy and the role of academia cast my mind back to my very first um, encounter with producing research and how it might be used in terms of adv advocacy and as evidence. And it was actually my PhD research, I did my PhD in Honduras. And I contested the suggestion that female-headed households are the poorest of the poor. Went back home, got my PhD, got my publications, got the title Doctor, all lovely. About two years later, I was uh, back out there and the person <coughs> from Honduras informing what the government had done with my research. The government had said, well, if female-headed households aren't the poorest of the poor, we don't have to support female-headed households. Hmm. Which was not my argument. My <laughs> argument was, you need to look at what's going on inside male-headed households around poverty inside the household. So I think one of the key issues for me, uh, uh, for us as researchers is, once research exists, is published, how it's used is out of our control. So in essence, we've got to be very careful what we actually put out into the public domain and how we do that if we don't want that co-opted. And what was interesting about that study is, policymakers don't usually go in for small-scale studies. And it was PhD research. It was a small study. So what it also highlighted is how what is counted as evidence is, of course, a political issue. And it was counted as evidence then, even though at another stage it would have been called anecdotal. Okay. It was evidence when it meant the government could actually justify something. So it's also around, I'm going to talk a little bit around the evidence. And I thought I'd start also with talking about two issues that are big at the minute within the UK around how we produce evidence. And one is big data and how we use big data, and particularly with the SDGs. But one is also the evidence synthesis review. And I don't know if they're hot here in Chile, but they're certainly something that many of the European governments are very, very keen on. And I had an experience of one. And so I thought I'd just start there and sort of work through. So the reason to start there was it raises issues around what is knowledge and how we count knowledge. And it raises issues for me around objectivity. Because the evidence synthesis review, and you can see here, how they describe it is very much around having this protocol and use of a standardized hierarchy of evidence that ranks evidence according to reliability and verifiability. I can't say that in English. I'm glad I'm not saying it in Spanish. I'm in huge amounts of trouble. So, what I find interesting about the evidence synthesis reviews is it's something that's really policymakers are very, very keen on that. They began, for those who aren't so sure of what they are, they began around, around uh, in medical practice. And it's quite interesting because the idea was that doctors were using their own experience to make decisions for patients. Now, I don't know about you, but I actually want my doctor to use their own experience to make decisions about patients. But the notion was that wasn't a good basis. When in fact what we should be doing is collecting all the studies, synthesising, drawing out the most reliable, and then all doctors using that. So the interesting thing about this notion of the evidence synthesis review is that it's not just about how we do research and what counts as good research, but it's about how we practice as well. And it's suggesting that that should inform what we do. So it's a big change from how doctors operate to this, this synthesis of evidence which then all should use. And why it's interesting as well is, it's moved on. So the UK, DFID is the Department for International Development in the United, in the United Kingdom, and they are very keen on it. They've, they have finance, so if you're looking for some funding from DFID, put in an idea for an evidence synthesis for you, because they love them, <laughs> and they financed a large number of them. And what they're saying is here, it makes it easier for policy makers and practitioners to develop evidence informed policy, <coughs> and it increases the value for money of policy by basing decisions on a rigorous understanding of what works. So what's interesting about them is A, 
it's very much linking research with policy by using what's out there, synthesising it, and then that becomes what we do. Evidence-informed policy. But second, notice, it's because it increases value for money. So as researchers, our question then, are we doing research to improve the value for money for the taxpayers of the UK? And for policymakers to be easier for policymakers to make decisions. Because this is the way that it's really pushing it when we look at that. Now, I would never have done an evidence synthesis in my life had I not been told to. <laughs> and I actually applied for funding, commission funding, um, by the Economic Commission, the Economic and Social Research Council, and DFID. And here's another interesting one about large funders at the minute. Um, they're all in the, um, again, I'm basing my experience on, on the UK. So the large funders in the UK are starting to be asked to be able to show what they've actually done. So the SRC DFID had financed 122 awards, millions of pounds. After about eight years, they decided they'd better have a look and see what information they'd actually produced. So all these big funders now are getting people in to look again at what's going on out of them. So again, we're back to our value for money, are very much driving this. And the idea about, around this evidence synthesis was to actually look at the gender uh, knowledge that came out of it. So one of the interesting things about it, other than I would say it's a lot of work, if anyone says to an evidence synthesis, just say no. <laughs> Particularly SLC different, say no. Because out of 122 awards, about 100 of them have produced publications. And a lot of them have produced three to eight publications. And we read every single one of them, looking for gender. And you would invariably find it in publication number eight, in one paragraph. And you just spent day of your life getting it. So there's a lot of work in them. And, it's, and for them, they're supposed to be objective. But of course, what counts as gender research for me may not count as gender research for other people. But what was interesting here is, what we were looking at as well was not what they asked us to look at, was not just what the studies have found out, not just the how, but the why. And I think, again, when we're looking at research, for me, it's really important to bear in mind, keep in mind that why are we doing that? Not just the what and the how, but the why. But also the which. And when you looked at what they funded, there was huge gender, because I'm a gender person, I can't talk gender, huge gendered silence. That sexual reproductive rights weren't there, violence was in there but not as human rights, abortion was certainly not there, FGM was not there, huge silences in what will and will not be funded. And I'm sure everyone who goes for funded research knows that there's certain things that we know are going to get funded and there's certain things that we know is more tricky to get funded. And the silences were clear in this study. But also there were silences in terms of who got funded. And key gendered academics were not those that had been funded. And Global South people were in as partners, particularly NGOs, not universities. And that's very much, when you look at the way that the programmes have been set up in the UK at the minute, it is encouraging people to look for NGOs as partners, yep. not to have. I review for the ESRC a lot, and I score low on all those who do not name people from universities outside the UK as equal partners. Those that put them in as, as, as partners rather than co eyes and that's but it's a real push in the UK. Now, Chile, I think, has gone off the ODA list. I think you're about to migrate off, so you won't have people from the SRC coming to you anymore, because you're off the list. So again, yeah, it's one of those year. things, if you're not on the list, yeah. Yeah. I thought you were migrating yeah. next last year. year we'll last year, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so all those people who used to come to you, they'll be off to Brazil now. Mm. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. It's also the country that we are, to you and anybody. So all that sort of thing, and it's really interesting to think how that knocks on, what's going on in the UK knocks on to other parts of the world in a massive way in that sense. So what we came out with was this typology of exclusion and inclusion. I might say ESRD, our ESRC did not ask us to come out with this, but this is what we came out with. <laughs> and there was a little bit of battle over it towards the end, but such is life with commissioned research. One of the issues with commissioned research is, of course, if the commissioner doesn't like it, what do you do? And how much are you actually prepared to tone down what, what they ask you to say? We, with this, we were asked to change the order in which we produced, we presented the type of order to try and make the best one, put the best one at the top rather than at the bottom. So that sort of thing kicks in again. So as researchers, 
We want that commission research because we want to influence organisations, but then those organisations can come back on us around how we do that. And the typology here is quite interesting because out of these 120, I was looking at gender, but you can look at it in, in various different issues, is how we actually do it. And we can see that 2% were gender neutral, 28% were gender blind, so even though it could be gender, they didn't talk about gender at all. But my favourite ones were the non-gendered. And that was when they told us there could be a gender approach, but they weren't going to do it. <laughs> and I think that's important to bear in mind now as well, because again, a lot of the big funders, they explicitly ask for gender. And so the change in how the calls went out changed how people reacted to that. So when they were told just to consider gender, they went, consider it, nah. <laughs> and moving through, we get much more of an explicit gender focus in the more latter uh, awards because they had to. But a lot of them went for this instrumentalist gender approach. So when you looked at it, it just disaggregated by sex. It didn't look at why there was differences between men and women, though. They just said, oh, look, X, Y, cross tabs. That's a nice thing. There's my final day. Or women were included almost incidentally because they happened to be working in a job. Or it was more that they were just there, but they weren't considered as gender. So again, when we're looking at this sort of issue, and you can look at it in terms of the environment, you can look at it in terms of climate change, how it's included is quite interesting, because the majority are not explicitly taking that approach. They're using it incidentally or instrumentally. And I think that's really important, because what we came out with was this idea that it's gender. We actually use, I've got a publication that actually has a title. Anyone a Star Trek fan? No. Okay, it has the title, it's gender gym, but not as we know it. <laughs> because this is how we would feel, like, actually, I should reference, I should cite Dr. Brian Lineker for coming out with that <laughs> in the pub one night. So it's this notion that what we found was that, and again, if, as researchers, it's quite interesting, because as a gender researcher, I actually found that a lot of the gendered research coming out of that grant, uh, 122 grants were produced by non-gendered academics. And yet that was then going to inform policymakers. And it was instrumentalist gender or sex disaggregation and it's informing policy so it's reproducing those policies because it's producing what they want to hear. And so, and I think if anyone knows about the uh, GCRF, which is the Global Challenges Research Fund, which is huge funding going on in Europe at the minute, and they're specifically looking for people to produce research that do not necessarily know anything about the Global South, but they want them to produce research on the Global South, which I find a very troublesome, problematic notion. But I think that when we're looking at, at uh, this idea of producing gender or any type of knowledge, then obviously the institutions and their own norms shape what they're going to fund. So our norms are shaped by the institutions, in this case ESRC DFID, and then that shapes what they're going to fund or not. And if you don't fit with that, you're going to struggle to get funding. And more importantly, I think what I find interesting is that who is producing knowledge these days? And one interesting thing is the World Bank is a huge producer of knowledge, and Nike, huge producer of knowledge around gender. Now, and DFID, Huge producer of knowledge around gender. Now, what's interesting about that is they produce knowledge, they then use that knowledge to evidence their policies. They say, oh, we've got evidence for it, but they produce the evidence. So, I don't know about you, I find that a little bit disturbing. And then Nike has constructed itself through its own research as a gendered institution. Everyone know about the girl effect? Oh, yes. So it's, it's very much these organisations, these big corporations, are producers of knowledge now. They're consumers of knowledge and they're producers of knowledge. And that's shaping our world. And these are corporates that are doing that. And sometimes academic work for them and sometimes they don't. But universities are doing that as well. The, I don't know about here, but the pressure to get money in, particularly certain types of money, is very hard. And it means you might take on work that you wouldn't necessarily want to and pressure from that. And one of the things we found from the ESRC DFID fund was also who is getting the money. And here, how not surprising. The majority of grant holders were UK based, male, older, professors, <laughs> with a background from Oxbridge, and interestingly, had been awarded a grant by the ESRC of DFID previously. 
So to get a grant, you've got to have had a grant. Yeah. It's one of those things. <laughs> uh, particularly on this one. So who's producing the knowledge? I think we really need to look at because I think it's a challenge for all of us when the corporates are doing it and who's getting it from the universities. And of course, it's nothing new. The World Bank has created itself as a, as a producer of knowledge since the 2000s. And you might say, well, it doesn't matter, but it does because they're producing the same old notions again and again and again. And here we've got data from the World Bank from 1990s to 2000, and they're still coming up with the same lines and the same arguments. So they're using the evidence to justify their economic efficiency approach around gender, for example. So here we go again with the same people producing the same stories. And what it means is we keep having the same gaps. And again, this is an interesting, I'm sure in anybody's field of research, you know a big gap. Mm -hmm. You know a gap. Or you know one of those things that people think they know, but actually we don't. Mm -hmm. And here's, this was mentioned this morning, 70% of the world's poor are women. Two of my favourites were mentioned this morning. One that's 70% of the world's poor are women, and one that women are 14 times more likely to die from disaster than men. <laughs> Neither of them have any basis whatsoever. The 14 times, the person who first cited it, we all, oh, we're on a, a gender disasters network, got in touch with them and said, where did it come from? She oh, got yeah. off the network. <laughs> she felt hassled because I think she'd actually just popped it in there mm -hmm. without a full reference. And everybody had started using it. So it's one of those, the more times we say it, and the more people who say it, it becomes fact. Oh, my God. And the 70% of the world's women is another one. Say so stated at Beijing, 70% of the world's poor are women and it is rising. Feminisation of poverty. Interestingly, in 2015, UN Women said the much cited factoid that 70% of the world's poor are women is now highly, widely regarded as improbable. So, what's interesting about this, everybody cites it. I think I've probably even got a paper that says 70% of the world's poor are women. And then someone said it this morning, I'm like, no. And then UN, uh, UN Women said this in 2015. In 2014, uh, someone from UN Women, quite high up, she remained nameless, had cited this fact in a talk. So she obviously didn't get the memo. <laughs> We're not saying this anymore. But what's interesting is, 20 years, it took 20 years not to find out how many of the world's poor women, or to improve what we know, but to actually come clean and say we don't know. Sorry about that, you've all been using that data to put no basis to it. So, what I'm really interested in about how these gaps keep going. So, um, what's interesting about that as well is around the data. And here's who's in from Sepal? Well done on your data around feminization. <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the things that the other thing that people are using is these big data sets. And again, what I'm finding interesting about that is the methodology matters. So on these big data sets, one of the publications we've got recently was looking at the big data sets around this feminisation of poverty issue. Because UN Women has come out, this, actually that fact, the fact toys were always in the footnote. And so they were obviously not really wanting to say it, but my co-writer Sylvia Chang found it in the footnote. And she said, let's go find the data. So we got without Brian and her looking at it, and this is Eclex looking at the data, and they said there's a re-feminisation. But there is, of course, so in Brazil said, there's a non and there's a defeminization. They're looking at the same data sets. They're looking at slightly different years and slightly different methodologies. So who do we believe? Chile? Chile, of course we believe Chile. <laughs> <laughs> I thought they were city. And policymakers like it because it says refeminization. So their policies are reinforced by this. This says no. Now, what we did also was take the two data sets and we applied the methodology from one to the data for the other to see what would happen. Yeah. No agreement anywhere. <laughs> but what it really brought home was these big data sets, the methodology matters and how we use them makes a whole difference. Yet, we are basing policy on this data. And what we're really then doing is basing policy on what we don't know. Now, one of the questions is, why don't we know more? And I love this quote from the World Bank. I've got circa 2000 because I've been using it for so long, and I don't know, I'm, I'm that out 14 times more. That's me. I can't remember where it came from. But I think it's great. If the right questions are asked, conventional poverty research tools can provide most of the gender-related answers. No. No, they can't. So this sort of notion is quite inherent, though. 
But it's easier to say female headed households are the poorest, so we'll target them. So, do we want data that suggests that's not the case? Because then we'd have to change our policy. So, we know that policies are often made on assumptions, but then they put into place very real consequences for the people involved, the men and women involved. Through those policies, we bring into being lived realities. And here we've got women being targeted, not because they're the poorest, that's the argument we're using, but because they're good with money, because they use resources efficiently, because they all go to the children, and because, as I said this morning, my lovely research, and lots of research from Latin America shows that men, sorry, men, <laughs> you tend to drink and gamble and smoke away the money, <laughs> rather than passing it on to other people in your household. So if I'm a policymaker with scarce resources, who am I going to target my resources at? Not you, sorry. I'm going to go for the dutiful good women. But of course then, the question is, a lot of focus is on irresponsible men. But as researchers, don't we have to turn that round and say, isn't it a problem that women are being quite so responsible, altruistic, not using the money on themselves? So again, asking difficult questions around that. So on this one, the idea then is here, that out of all this non-research, comes this targeting of women with resources. And for me, that is not doing gender, that's just targeting women for efficiency reasons. But if we're looking at doing gender and coming to the SDGs, then obviously, very key here is sexual reproductive health and rights and violence against women and girls. And what was very interesting about the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, is the shift in the gender discourse from the MDGs to the SDGs. Because the MDGs were critiqued for not being gendered enough, the SDGs are critiqued for being too gendered. I mean, you know, we're going to end all discrimination against all women, all women in all its forms everywhere by 2030. We're going to end all violence in all its forms by... Can we even imagine that? How many years have we got till 2030? It's about 11 years? Okay, young people, you can project another 11 years. I don't want to go there thinking about that. It's like, ooh, by then. It's, it's impossible to think how we're going to actually achieve those. So over-ambitious is the SDGs. So how can we actually measure that? We don't even know how many of the world's poor are women. So how can we actually measure how we're going to end violence against women? Because we can't even measure violence. So I was involved in the SDSN, Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And when we were looking at the indicators, we wanted things like uh, perceptions of safety for walking in the street. No, too difficult. You can only have things like number of cases reported to the police. And we know that's problematic, because if you have a big push, they can go up, and that doesn't mean anything. Or number of cases that are progressed through, or number of cases. So it's that sort of thing. We're still bound by the indicators in terms of how we're actually going to show that we've done everything. And what was interesting about here as well was, and I'm on a quick side here, I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent, obviously. So during this, I was having, I was involved also, that's me at the back, by the way. With a sign that says NGO. <laughs> <laughs> it's a teaching slide, that's why my students find it for me. You know, when I'm sitting talking, so in front of the Netherlands. And this is when one way when we talk about advocacy is, of course, this was for the Sendai framework, which I'm sure you all know what the Sendai framework is. No, of course no. not. <laughs> this is the International Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. Mm. It used to be called that the old one was Higher uh, Framework for Action, HFA. And if you Googled HFA, if you Googled MDGs, you got Millennium Development Goals. If you Googled HFA, which was the equivalent of the MDGs, you got Halal Farming Association. <laughs> That's how well known the disaster risk reduction framework was. But I was involved in that, and what's interesting around that is if you move from being a researcher to try and actually go and physically lobby, I don't know how many people have done it. It's like banging your head against a brick wall. That wall will be good. That wall will be a good head banging wall. Because you can see from this, this was a, this was a, a framework on international disaster risk reduction. This was the indicators and the glossary. And if you went to G, there was geological hazard and greenhouse gases. I think there's something missing there. <laughs> Might be gentle, wasn't there? And, they said, oh, shall we have sex, sex disaggregated data? And the chair asked in the room to the member states, would anyone have a problem with that? And two countries said yes, so no, we can't have that then. <laughs> now, I'm saying this because 
I myself had this vision of what UN intergovernmental negotiations were like. <laughs> no, I was so amazed. And the reason, if you see the, the nice looking bloke in the corner, <laughs> Mr. El Salvador. <laughs> Mr. El Salvador was great. Now, if you're lobbying then, you can make a statement, and that's me making a statement. Notice I'm just NGO. <laughs> I am. Other times I just have women, which I really like as well. I just have all the world's women here, right? <laughs> this is me. Right. Whereas, of course, with those people who had to sit behind the disability one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these labels are stuck there. But you can talk, but nothing will get actually taken forward unless a country rep mentions it. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Osamadon was great. He was into gender, he could take everything forward. We all loved him. Mm -hmm. I'm smiling, even looking at him. <laughs> and then one day, when everything had to be talked about in the formal process, guess what? He was ill. <laughs> the NGOs were all sitting in the back of the room crying. Physically, they were crying. Because if it was not mentioned at that time, it was not going to get into the next negotiation stage. So just something as simple as Mr. El Salvador getting on a bus in Geneva next to someone who had flu. So it meant he wasn't there. A friend of mine said, well, she was involved in negotiations, and she watched the country rep go out of the room to have a cigarette, just at the, when the bit of the text she wanted him to lobby on came up. So when we think about it, what do we know about how these policies are made? And the, the actual negotiations. And we think it's very high level and all the rest of it, but we know it's actually highly political. And people go in with bottom line. And when I wrote the high level, uh, the report of the high level panel, I was amazed. They asked me to write about economic, uh, economic growth and women basically as an untapped resource. And by the way, the reason I did it was, just so you know, here comes some parallelations. My then dean was involved, and he phoned me up and said, would you write this report? Now, can I say no? He's my dean. So I had to say yes. So again, we often feel under pressure to these things. So I turned it round and did Laura about, well, if you want to know about economic, economic growth, you need to put in sexual reproductive health rights. And they actually bought it. And then I talked to people afterwards, they put it in because they knew it would be negotiated out. And they needed to start high to have somewhere to negotiate from, to come down from. And gender is one of those things that will get negotiated out. And if you work on any of those more political social issues, they can be negotiated out. And we can see gender move just by a very small change in words. It used to be in a sexual reproductive health and rights in the high level panel. And it moved to ensure universal access to sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights. So just by changing about three words, we negate sexual rights. And if you're not looking closely, you won't notice it. So policy documents you need to read very closely and keep your eye on what's going on with them in order to ignore it. So the SDGs for me are fine, over ambitious, but also lacking in some things. So what do we know? Interesting here, there's uh, the UN Statistics Division. So as researchers, we want to know what we already know to, to fill the gap. So here, 80% uh, sexist aggregated statistics on education, 65 to 70% sexual reproductive health facility, but only 30 to 40% of countries regularly produce statistics on informal employment, unpaid work, and violence against women. So we can see we've got huge gaps. We've got these ambitious SDGs, and we've got huge gaps in what we actually know. We've also got this move going on around how we know, and these, uh, these move to the individual level, in, in, individual deprivation measures. And it's the Australians that are leading on this very much. And why? The Australian government is financing it. So we've got a big push going there, some really interesting research coming out. And these are trying to change the methodology. Because the others are using the standard methodology and trying to get gender lessons out of them. Can we take data that is not gendered and try and make it gendered? No. Because then we make assumptions about what the meaning is. And then we have to make assumptions that may not be wrong. So it's a need to look at a different way of doing it. But the questionnaire for the IDM is like, I, I was asked to comment on it by Janet and Sharon, and it was like, I think it was 30 or 40 pages long. 
And so you can imagine the cost of doing that on, to make it representative of a country. It's a big issue. So they're, they're actually doing it at the minute and they're moving on with that. Now, in terms of the SDGs, it's also spawned a lot of other indexes and indicators. And in the gender one, you've got the SDGGI, and they've introduced another 33 indicators to the other 129 indicators we already have. So my concern very much around where we're at now with the SDGs and with, with evidence is we've got all these different indicators and I'm really not clear what they're measuring. I really am not clear that we're measuring what we need to know, we're measuring what we can measure, i.e. what we've got out there, not what we actually need to measure. And that is something that I think as researchers we need to be working on and advocating around. And in terms of that, what's interesting about them is, just in case you're interested, the top countries, uh, they're drawing some correlations because they have come out with some data and the top countries tend to have a common, reasonably strong public service and social safety nets and the bottom ones are the ones you might think so. So again, it's reinforcing the same story. So we're using data that is telling many different tales and we're telling many different tales from it. But do you see what I mean by that? I'm trying to see if I see what I mean by that. So if we're using data around income, the high-income countries, if that's part of the indicators around gender equality, it's going to automatically push those that are high in the income into the high in gender, and those that are low in that into the low. So I've got this concern that what we're doing is we're just using the same data and telling many different stories with it. And I don't know we can. And it concerns me a lot. I don't sleep over it. <laughs> Seriously, because I've actually... My, my, Brian, who I work with, is actually working on it at the minute. It, yes. I mean, can we do that is a big question I have around methodology. So, what do we know? Not as much as we pretend to. Got a lack of data. Conceptualizations are changing. Do policy people really want to know? Mm, I'm not that convinced because, you know, the problem may not match the solution, but the solution sometimes justifies the problem. Goes the wrong way around. I know, I think I've got an answer. Oh, let's go start the problem. Yeah. Off we go. And I think we've got a lot of that there. And should we push for more gender? One of the issues I've got going is that I'm concerned about including more gender in. And I'm concerned about the fact that the people who are engendering research these days and policy are non-gender people. And that concerns me. It's suggesting that, and someone said to me, oh, it's okay, I can do gender. I'm a man. Okay? Now, the notion around that is because I live as a gender being. But, you know, I sit on a bus, that doesn't mean I can fix the engine. Okay, so it's the notion of who knows and who's an expert. And I know we don't want to construct more experts, but I do think we do need to think about knowledge construction and how we actually make clear that things like gender, things like the environment, are not things you can just add on and think you know. It's actually a specialist subject. And again, I've got some concerns about it. If anyone knows, wants to know a, a, an easy way to get a publication. Okay, so, <laughs> no, I'll just tell you a little story now. Yeah. So, I get sent a lot of uh, articles to review. And increasingly in gender and disasters, and I did this piece of work on extractive industries, don't even get me going by how it got there. Commissioned <laughs> research for you. Oh yeah, I know about extractive industries. And, I get sent increasingly people who have looked at the existing large scale data sets disaggregated by gender or by sex and then have gender in the title. And the people obviously know nothing about gender and they're making wild assumptions about what the data means. And so I got sent this one by Nature Energy. And I, I was late replying and they hassled me, so I wrote a big ramp back go. And they said, oh, it's okay, we've, we've filled it now. And I said, good. Because I don't want to review this. I'm sick. I am, you know, when you've had one of those days. <laughs> I'm sick of being sent these things. I am sick of this. Anyway, about three weeks later, the editor wrote back and said, We've been thinking about what you said. Would you like to write a comment, please? <laughs> so, out of a rant to an editor, came actually quite a nice little publication. <laughs> so, try it one day. And, <laughs> and I actually did want to tell that story in a big meeting, and someone came up to me at the end and went, Hello. I'm the other editor of Nature. <laughs> 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 anyway, so, so I'm on a little bit of a 
rant around how you actually know and who knows. And the other thing around, around the environment, and where I'm seeing it coming through is on disasters, climate change, environmental issues, and energy. That's where I'm particularly getting sent articles to review that are supposed to be about gender, but are just sex disaggregation of data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In those fields is where I'm seeing them. People taking, particularly statisticians, particularly male statisticians, taking, sorry, large-scale <laughs> data sets, and then, oh look, I've discovered gender. I've discovered a data set that has not been dis disaggregated, and I'm off to do it. And I'm very concerned then, if we push for more gender, as uh, Shelley McGregor, sorry, this quote happened to be in Spanish from this morning, but Shelley McGregor reminds us we've got to be very careful what we celebrate. We've got to be very careful how we present gender. We've got to be very careful about who then is actually representing issues like gender, environment, climate change, around how we're actually getting that. So my lessons drawing from that are on, on the gender front, just and, and hopefully they can be thought about in the wider one. How it matters, how we do it matters, uh, who does it matters, and if you're not an expert, what you're doing gender, 